Welcome to the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Rochester. For more than 150 years, ours has been a congregation of open minds and loving hearts, celebrating many sources of wisdom and many spiritual paths. Your faith, your doubts, your questions, your hopes for our world and your story are welcome here. And our doors are closed because our hearts are open, living our values of care and compassion. You can stay connected online through many groups, classes, and forums, and more. This week, we're going to take a brief break from our Wednesday forums, but we'll reconvene next week. Today's offering will go to support Revolutionary Earth, an organization here in Rochester supporting environmental sustainability, which you may have heard about at a recent forum or Ani's reflection last week. You can give at urochmn.org slash give. And a huge thank you to our pledge team for hours and hours of work on this year's campaign in a hard time to connect with people, including coordinating the online variety show, setting up a parade in the parking lot in the midst of gale force winds with so many volunteers, making the cutest chalice cookies ever. I hope you didn't miss those. Because of their hard work, we're on our way to reaching our goal. The campaign officially ends this Wednesday. So we hope to hear from you if we haven't yet. There's several folks we still hope to hear from. Simply let the office know through email or phone or the online form or homing pigeon, whatever works, to help us plan for next year's budget by indicating your pledge. Thank you for sustaining our church. And in your e-news, you may have seen a surprise special concert. Last year in April, we were scheduled to have Peter Mayer, a wonderful UU musician, composer of Blue Boat Home, one of our favorite hymns here. He was going to be here for an in-person concert. It didn't work out. The pandemic hit. So this year, we're going to have a wonderful online live concert with Peter. You can join us online for free, members and friends, Saturday, April 10th. So watch your e-news for more or contact the office or see the website for the links. Please help us celebrate this church and generosity with a fun evening of music with Peter Mayer. And two special invitations this week. You can join us Thursday evening online on our YouTube channel for an annual service that's echoing the Jewish Passover and Christian Holy Week traditions, including a Universalist communion, seven o'clock this Thursday. And for next Sunday, for Easter, we invite you to send photos in. We need your photos, signs of spring and hope, whether it's sunshine, plants, flowers, birds, smiling faces, rain boots, whatever it is. We want you to join in the service. You can send those pictures by this Wednesday to the office to be in our Easter parade of pictures as part of next week's service. And finally, in the words of the Reverend Eliza Tupper Wilkes, minister of this church in the 1870s, May our faith in humanity and our message of hope and good cheer light our way. It's good to be together. This is the Unitarian Universalist Church. This is the Church of the Flaming Chalice. This is the Church of the Open Mind. This is the Church of the Loving Heart, where friends come together and share. I started to think about the idea of commitment, a 40-year-old memory came to mind. 
a minister friend was going through a tough patch. His father was going to divorce his mother and leave her for someone else. His mother wanted help from him, not so much as a son, but as a minister and a counselor. One thing that came out of this was a sermon he delivered that has stuck with me all these years. My paraphrase doesn't hold a candle to the original. He felt in relationships there wasn't always passion. There were some times that there wasn't even happiness or joy. If there was still commitment and respect, a path to love and passion could still be found. My wife, Pat, volunteers or volunteered prior to COVID-19 in the county jail. She gets to know a few detainees better than most. She has been in contact with one man in prison living with mental illness and addiction. He has three older siblings in addition to his mother and father. Of his family, only his mother maintains contact. His father and siblings criticize his mother for maintaining contact. She is committed to be a mother to all four children. It's tempting to always think of commitment in positive terms. I'm committed and I'm going forward now. But it can lead us to a different rocky path. While a worthwhile commitment helps lead us through those rocky paths to a sunnier place. I keep thinking about how much the word commitment has come into my brain over this last year. So many of us are committed to making this pandemic go away. And the commitments we've made like quarantining and not seeing family or friends and wearing masks out in public. I mean, all of those things have a level of commitment that I don't think any of us could have even imagined a year ago. Today's story reminds me of one of the things that many people did at the beginning a year ago. They committed to spreading joy and hope during a time when there were so many things that were uncertain. I hope that you can see in this story a little bit of yourself at that point. Maybe Something Beautiful, How Art Transformed a Neighborhood by F. Isabel Campoy and Teresa Howell, illustrated by Rafael Lopez. In the heart of a gray city, there lived a girl who loved to doodle, draw, color, and paint. Every time she saw a blank piece of paper, Mira thought to herself, hmm, maybe. And because of this, her room was filled with color and her heart filled with joy. On her way to school one day, Mira gave a round apple to Mr. Henry, the owner of the shop down the street. She gave a flower to Ms. Lopez, the lady with the sparkling eyes. She gave a songbird to Mr. Sachs and a red heart to the policeman who walked up and down the streets. On her way home, Mira taped a glowing sun onto the wall hiding in the shadows. Her city was less gray, but not by much. The next day, Mira saw a man with a pocket full of paintbrushes. He gazed at the wall. He looked at her son. He held up his fingers in the square and peered through them. Hmm, he said thoughtfully. What do you see? Mira asked. Maybe, maybe something beautiful, the man replied. And just like that, he dipped a brush in the paint. Bam! Pow! The shadows scurried away. Sky blue cut through the gloom. The man's laughter was like a rainbow spreading across the sky. Who are you? Mira asked. I'm an artist, he said. A muralist. I paint on walls. I'm an artist too, she told him. He handed Mira a brush. Then come on! Mira dipped it in the loudest color she saw. Yowee! The wall lit up like sunshine. 
As the man drew pictures on the bricks, Mira added color, punch, and pizzazz. Soon, Mr. Sachs joined in. Then came others. Everyone painted to the rhythm. Salsa, merengue, bebop. Even Mira's mama painted and danced the cha-cha-cha. The whole neighborhood became a giant block party until the policeman walked up. Excuse me, he said. The music stopped. Mira put her brush down. They were surely in trouble. The officer cleared his throat, then paused. May I paint with you, he asked. So Mira handed him a paintbrush, and the music started again. Teachers and papas jumped in. Babies, too. Mira and the man handed out brush after brush. Color spread throughout the streets. And so did joy. Wherever Mira and the man went, art followed like the string of a kite. After they colored the walls, they painted utility boxes and benches. They decorated sidewalks with poetry and sunshine. And everyone danced. Together, they created something more beautiful than they ever had imagined. When their clothes were finally splattered with a million different colors, everyone sat down to rest except the muralist. His eyes sparkled. You, my friends, are all artists, he told them. The world is your canvas. He smiled wide, then pulled everything together in big sweeping motions. His paintbrush was like a magic wand. When he was finished, Mira added one more bird way up in the sky. Maybe, she thought, just maybe. It's so nice to think of something like commitment as being as simple as hanging something in your window, something that could spread joy and beautify things and really just lighten everyone's heart. I hope that everybody gets a chance to take something bright and colorful and share it with the world. you. We are still physically separated but are seeing a light in the future as we look forward to being together again. For now we continue to gather in this virtual way as we continue to create a place of communal caring and connection. Be enriched by the virtual presence of each other and draw yourself closer into the heart of love at this time of service and reflection. In this time together we ask that our minds be open, our hearts welcoming, our arms embracing. Here we honor all who support us in this caring, loving, and all-inclusive ministry. We send gratitude to John and Sandy McLaughlin, serving as our caring coordinators for the last two weeks, arranging care for our members and friends in need. Julie Gilkinson will take over tomorrow for the next two, and we thank her for that. The members of our caring committee are wonderful examples of our compassionate community, holding us up as we go through challenging and happy times. And during this time of increasing needs in our lives and community, we encourage you to reach out for support and help if you are experiencing hardship. Many of us may need additional care, whether it be personal pastoral care, grocery delivery, or an errand run, and we encourage you to reach out to Reverend Luke or myself with that request. We thank all of you who have served our congregation in this way over the last few months. Today's flowers are shared by Gus Braga in remembrance of his late wife, Bernadette, who passed away 19 years ago.
They were married for 25 years. In this community, we make time each week to share pieces of our lives with one another. We do this because each person here has value. Each person's experience matters. We lift up those whose lives are touched by sadness, by illness, by worry, or by loneliness. We revel in those who are celebrating joys in their lives. May their happiness lift us all. May all of us find comfort, hope, joy, and healing strength in this community. Please keep Gary Donovan in your thoughts. Gary has completed four cycles of treatment for his myeloma diagnosis and is healing up. After a two, week, two weeks of rest, he will begin a stem cell transplant program on April 6th. Ronice and Gary are grateful for the loving concern and care of church friends. Please continue to send love and healing thoughts their way as they continue on Gary's healthcare journey. As we round the corner of uncertainty, we make the commitment to focus on reaching out to all of those around us to let them know we are still here and still holding and supporting them. Cards and phone calls and socially distanced visits can help to lift up those that you love, and we encourage you all to support our community and businesses as they safely reopen. May the faith in the spirit of life, love for the community of earth, and love for the light in each other be ours now and in all the days to come. I want you to take a deep breath. Breathe deep the breath of life wherever you are. Settle down from the freneticness of your mind or body or soul in these days. As spring starts to break forth and the ground is muddy, feel beneath you the earth in its ancient turning. Above you the growing light of sky and the stars shining with their ancient light holding you in this moment here. I invite you into this time held in this house of love and generosity and grace and hope here in this community of possibility, of solidarity. I invite you into this time of meditation, this time of prayer, first by sharing silence together. Spirit of life, source of love, God of a thousand names and beyond all naming. Sometimes this world, in the mud and the muck of spring, filled with the messy beginnings of life, it can seem like we won't ever get there, wherever there is. Sometimes we simply need to simplify, to do the next Thing in the right direction, the next word or action of kindness, the next refraining from a word or action of meanness, the next step through the mud, though we may falter a bit. We need to take a little lean backwards sometimes before we can get our bearings to move forward. May we know in this muddy season which is the only way life can take root and grow, may we know that we are gardeners of the soul, that we need to work in the mud and the muck before any life can spring forth. And we hold in our hearts this day all those who suffer in mind, in body or spirit. My goodness, we hold our country and our world and our communities. We hold the people in Atlanta and the people in Boulder and all those unknown and unnamed each day across our communities and world. Lives cut short by our society's obsession with guns and violence and access to weapons and flimsy laws. May our thoughts and our prayers turn into policy and action and votes and accountability. May we turn our swords into plowshares and study war no more. We hold in our hearts all those seeking healing, mind, body, or spirit, and I invite you to bring the names you're holding this day in joy or in sorrow, celebration or concern 
and silently or aloud now in this time to speak their names. For all those names, spoken, unspoken, known, unknown, may we be forever grateful for the fabric of love and life and grace that holds us together. May those threads hold us in strength and in love. These words of meditation come from W.E.B. Du Bois. God of the springtime, giver of flower, field, and fruit. Smile on us in these earnest days when the work is heavy and the toil wearisome. Lift up our hearts to the things worthwhile, sunshine and night, the dripping rain, the song of birds, books and music, the voices of friends. Lift up our hearts to these this day and grant us thy peace. Amen. The first reading is Good Bones by poet and author Maggie Smith. Life is short, though I keep this from my children. Life is short, and I've shortened mine in a thousand delicious, ill-advised ways. I'll keep from my children. The world is at least 50% terrible, and that's a conservative estimate, though I keep this from my children. For every bird, there is a stone thrown at a bird. For every loved child, a child broken. Life is short, and the world is at least half terrible. And for every kind stranger, there is one who would break you. Though I keep this from my children. I'm trying to sell them the world. Any decent realtor taking you through a real shithole chirps on about good bones. The place could be beautiful, right? You could make this place beautiful. 
The second reading is Yes by poet and pacifist William Stafford. It could happen any time, tornado, earthquake, Armageddon, it could happen. Or sunshine, love, salvation. It could, you know. That's why we wake, look out. No guarantees in this life. But some bonuses, like morning, like right now, like noon, like evening. The Holocaust is a stunning reminder of the tragic results of prejudice and hate toward other people. But it is also a reminder that hope held firm will eventually reign victorious over the greatest of odds. The following words were inscribed on the walls of a cellar in Cologne, Germany, where Jews were hiding from the Nazis during World War II. Hope was all they had to hold on to. Hope was their only bridge to a brighter tomorrow. likely know the experience of needing to convince yourself of something that's not easy to do but you know it's good for you or for your family or even the world maybe something simple like changing a daily routine or doing those annoying stretches for an injury or for chronic pain maybe something really hard like deciding to have that conversation with a loved one that you've been avoiding about something you know is likely going to cause tension or could hurt feelings, whatever it is. Maybe something even harder, like deciding that your own individual well-being or pocketbook or safety is less important than communal well-being and wealth and safety. 
So you vote or you lobby or you petition what you used to think was your own interest against that in the interest of the common good. Or maybe it's the opposite that you're needing right now to believe that you are worthy enough for love and care and health and wholeness that you stop trying to be something you're not, stop trying to give up and give your energy and love and whatever it is to things that aren't worth it. To decide that you're worth reaching out to others for help or to share a struggle with someone or to refuse exploitation or abuse in a thousand ways and commit to your own healing. No matter what it is, whatever you've needed or are still needing to convince yourself of, the only way you normally get to making that decision, crossing that hard threshold of a change of mind or heart or soul, of making a commitment for betterment, for self or community, most of the time that means both, all of the above, is when you decide that even when it's hard, and especially when it's hard, or I don't really want to do it, it's worth it. You decide weighing all the incredible complex things in life, trying to navigate and put together this puzzle, you decide it's not easy, but it's worth it. I'm worth it. We are worth it. Or that the possibility of healing or justice or love is worth it. Worth it for yourself, for your community, for the world. Worth it just because of the simple principle of it. That it's worth the struggle. It's worth the hard threshold. It's worth crossing those moments. That over your head, somewhere deep down, you believe, even when God or love or hope seem silent, like the choir sang, and no one's there and the sun is not shining, you still know there's music. That there is some love or God or beauty somewhere, and you convince yourself enough of that fact that this world, your life, has good bones, like any good realtor would say. Something worth preserving, some inherent dignity shining eternally within. That it's worth making the commitment to do the hard thing, whatever, whatever that is. Life is short, writes the poet. Keeping the ill-advised decisions and the harshness and meanness of the world from their children, she writes, but still, even so, trying to sell them on the world. To chirp on about the good bones that it could be, it can be that you can make this place beautiful. Because, as the other poet writes, there are no guarantees in this life. No guarantees of goodness, of kindness, of justice, of love, but some bonuses, like morning, like evening, like right now. No guarantees. We're entering this time of the Jewish Passover and the Christian Holy Week, both traditions of gathering around tables, telling the stories of their people of resilience and perseverance and courage and hope. We'll gather online this Thursday evening, finding the threads of both of those traditions and how they still teach us these primary taproots of our tradition and faith. And those stories are also the words like the choir sang and the poets remind us of needing to sell ourselves on the world or convince ourselves of the goodness of the world even when there are no guarantees. And we see these stories played out in a thousand ways over the generations because we know in these stories, and many like them, that when Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday today, as the story goes, and all the decisions leading up to this week of betrayal and crucifixion at the hands of empire, a familiar story. Each decision, each act of solidarity with the oppressed, in relationship with the marginalized, in proclaiming an understanding of religion that is about moving us beyond ourselves to loving our neighbor, even our enemy, he and those like him knew 
that it was a threat to empire to live and teach and be that way. But he's willing to put his life at risk for the work of justice and liberation. And in the story of the Exodus, of the Jewish people seeking liberation and freedom, the text paints a different picture than Charlton Heston miraculously parting the sea. But the Hebrew word there for the Red Sea is the Sea of Reeds. It's ambiguous, and there's different stories about it. But the Sea of Reeds actually was a shallow, marshy place, not so Hollywood-esque. But some Jewish theologians have interpreted the story as just as dangerous. The Red Sea, the Sea of Reeds, both dangerous. That individually, you cannot cross a marsh with any sense of certainty or safety with your young children or belongings. But if you go together, if you stay together, you help each other. You keep each other steady and stable. And yet and still, Pharaoh and the chariots will not reach you because you have found the strength it takes to travel through the mud and the muck toward freedom. And that freedom bound together in community is worth it. That story has played out a thousand times when people suffering under empire have refused to believe that it was good enough to stay in that place, physical, mental, spiritual, and knowing the risk, they believed it was worth it to make their way out, to get free. When the masses gathered at the Edmund Pettus Bridge, again and again, they knew the risk of those batons and the centuries of hate. And when suffragettes gathered in March and confronted their loved ones and those in power, they knew the risk of putting their own ways of life in jeopardy. In people longing for freedom of so many kinds, large or small, sometimes communal, sometimes personal hell, it is never certainty that propels someone or community to take those risks to set out on that journey. It's commitment, not certainty. Commitment to an ideal, a commitment to hope, a commitment to an uncertain, unguaranteed future, convincing each other, convincing themselves it's worth it, committing their hearts, even their lives, to the world as it could and should be. And we know, my goodness, we know from this year, from these recent wakes and old hatreds compounded toward Asian people, toward women, the stigmatizing of work, and in particular sex work in the conversation around it, as one colleague wrote recently, as if capitalism and classism doesn't demand exploitation of so many bodies in so many kinds of work. The American obsession with gun rights and violence that explodes in fits of rage almost always from white men right in the middle of our lives, things just break open and the news cycle shatters our hearts again. We know we are worth more than all of this. That this world and our future is worth the hard work of hearts shattering apart sometimes and mending them together again. Of waking to another day, no guarantees it will all get better, but still it's worth it. We have generations of ancestors who have proclaimed in similar and worse circumstances, it's worth it. Sometimes no guarantees isn't just a flimsy, just do it anyway, you never know, just try it out, like throwing noodles against a wall and seeing what sticks or something. But sometimes saying no guarantees means that we can't assume things are just going to turn out okay, that our lives, this world will just turn out okay unless we do our part, unless we all do our part in whatever ways we can to do our part of the work, to take our part in the journey, to reach out to each other through the reeds and the mush, to hold on to each other, even as we're faltering in body or spirit, no guarantees, is more often than not the reminder that it takes commitment through hard things for change, for hope, for justice, for love.
It isn't some guarantee that all will be well on its own. But by our bond of fellowship, our sacred honor and obligation to love our neighbor and care for each other, to commit to the remaking of the world, to convince ourselves that it's worth it, we're worth it in the face of every risk and obstacle. It's worth it, that we're worth it. This world, this life, it has good bones. There's beauty even in the hard places. If we're willing to find and restore and protect the beauty that began with the brilliant light of the first stars and believing it is still shining within us, made of those shining stars, sacred, broken, and beloved. You can't make it to liberation and freedom. You can't make it to new life and restoration or resurrection, to love and to justice and to hope. Without remembering, we must stick together, love each other through the mug and the muck, through the betrayals, through the risk, knowing that our becoming free together is worth the journey. It isn't certain, no guarantees, but some bonuses along the way, some moments where we remember together we are worth it, and together we will get there. It's a mighty long way from over yonder. It's a mighty long way from there to here. And we're going to take it, oh yes, one day at a time. So that we can make that move from there to here. Amen.